Okay, hello. Not much left, uh, last talk of the day before the closing game. Hi, uh, for those of you who saw my previous talk uh, three hours ago, not, nothing has changed. My name is still Bartosz and I'm still uh, with Linaro uh, in the Qualcomm landing team. Uh, I've been around for some time. I've, I've been doing open source for 15 years professionally. I maintain a, a, uh, G the GPL subsystem in the kernel. I maintain a couple of drivers. Uh, I maintain a, a user space project that's called libgpiod. And I have worked for some time in the open source, which made me uh, aware of the problem that is technical debt. And this is what is going to be the subject of my talk. And as I said, I'm with Linaro. Thank you for having me here and thank you for uh, letting me work on interesting subject. Please check us out. We make software run on ARM. So my talk is going to be about technical debt. Uh, probably everyone has encountered it in one way or another. And what is technical debt? The best way to describe it is by making a parallel to financial debt. So financial debt, you need money now, you borrow it, and then later on you pay it with interest, meaning you pay more of it than you borrowed. Technical debt is not different. So what you really borrow is time. You need to ship something, so you choose a solution that is suboptimal, that, but that allows you to implement something faster and ship it sooner. But there's going to be a penalty, which means that because of the suboptimal solution you chose, you will have to probably down the line spend more time to work backtrack or improve this solution eventually to, uh, to, to, to make it work to make it more generalized and, and uh, make it work in more, uh, more cases. Just like financial debt, when it's time to pay back, you can actually decide to take on more debt and uh, eventually pay even more interest. This works similarly with technical debt. You can just stack workarounds uh, and, and, and continue, using on, on continue on using suboptimal solutions but that will mean that eventually you will have more and more trouble maintaining that code. And just like with financial debt, not every debt is wrong, not every debt is bad. You can borrow money now, you can have an idea for an investment, you can invest that money, and the profit that you will make on that investment will actually be higher than the interest you will pay on the loan. That also makes sense in software. There are, however, uh, there is, however, good technical debt and bad technical debt. And uh, in some places, for instance, in uh, implementation details, using a worse solution may actually not be that bad because it's easy to improve something that is behind a programming interface. But whenever technical debt is used when creating exposed data structures and programming interfaces, this is where the problem starts. So imagine that you want to start working on a, and yes, all images have been generated with uh, generative AI. Uh, imagine you want to start working on some project. Uh, and I'm not talking about uh, starting a new project from scratch, not necessarily, but you just start working on a piece of software. So there's going to be uh, typically three categories of, uh, of, of a starting point in, in every project. So every, uh, everyone who likes their job and like who here doesn't like their job, who doesn't like coding. So, so we, we're all probably passionate uh, about software development. So the best thing that uh, can happen when you start a new project is uh, when you have an empty plot of land and uh, can, you know, uh, start your master working on your masterpiece exactly like you imagine it. You have, uh, you're doing everything from scratch. But this is uh, rare. Like, uh, how many people have started a project from scratch and it took off and it's used by, by, uh, by people? Well, uh, so, so as, as you can see, this is, uh, this is quite rare. So the best, the next best thing is something, a project that is well established, that may be complex, but actually everything fits together. It's uh, well maintained. Uh, all the APIs uh, do what they do, do what, do what they should and, and work correctly. And uh, of course, it's complicated. Sometimes you need some deeper knowledge in order to get into it, but uh, all the pieces fit. 
And then the third case is when you take over a project and uh, it, it, it looks more like this. So it's uh, different things stitched together. You're wondering what uh, this or this part does and, and then you try to modify something, but uh, every, every, every time you, know, you, you, just, you just move one piece, uh, everything, everything crumbles. Uh, we would uh, call it uh, brittle uh, code, right? So even if you start from scratch on an empty plot of land, uh, it's not uncommon to see your project evolve into, uh, into, something, into something complex and uh, hard to maintain even if on, on the way you, you have some refactoring attempts. So why does it happen? When you start a project, not necessarily, you will not necessarily be aware of all the use cases uh, it will face, especially if you start a project that will solve a problem you encountered, and then all of a sudden people start using it, and they, they, the users use it in, in so-called wrong ways, so in ways you, you never imagined uh, that this project would be useful. Uh, then they will come to you and ask, okay, so can we implement this or that feature and or even provide patches, hopefully, uh, for this or that feature? And you cannot really predict all these new uh, things that users will come up with. So next thing is that almost in every kind of software, whether you're talking about a monolithic kernel that officially doesn't have any, any API stability or a C library that you expose to user space, you will have to maintain some interfaces because let's face it, we don't change interfaces all the time when we have uh, users uh, of our code, when we have active users in the field of our code. So you need to maintain some stability for old use cases. You need to introduce new features. Possibly you have provided some interface that is now hard to extend. Uh, and even the Linux kernel that, as I said, officially does not have any, any stability. If you have a thousand users of a function, then changing that function to something new is not gonna be that easy. And then you have the user space ABI in the kernel, which uh, officially never changes, which will lead us to you know, introducing new ABIs instead of uh, removing or modifying old ones. And then there's, uh, one thing, another thing that is simply not being grumpy enough as a maintainer. And uh, just as like we heard with the recent uh, XZ, uh, XZ backdoor where the maintainer has basically been bullied into accepting this or that change and then eventually relinquishing his maintenance. There is a reason why, why maintainers uh, are and, and often should be uh, grumpy. And you know, if you look at Krzysztof, he's the nicest person ever in, in person, but when you encounter him on the, on the mailing list, uh, you, you may not get that impression. Uh, so whenever you know, business priorities take over uh, and you accept code uh, without demanding it to represent a certain, certain level, that stacks up over time and you end up accruing technical debt. So some kernel specific issues. Um, the ABI and API stability. So API, just like I uh, said, when your subsystem in the kernel is being used all over the kernel, it becomes really tricky to change anything. This is why we, many subsystems will have uh, two iterations of an interface and programming interface uh, existing at the same time because it's just simply so difficult to, to remove or modify port the old users to the new API. And the user space API, as long as the user space tells you, oh no, I, I was using this, why did it change? You have to go back. So you literally have to support your user space facing interface forever if needed or if, requ if requested. And then we have, the kernel is officially monolithic, but it is not really um, logically monolithic. What, what happens is you have different, you have to look at it as different libraries with different users of those libraries. And now we have kernel subsystems where people come up and say, okay, so I will implement a new subsystem, but instead of doing it um, in a way that will address this specific problem, people usually, what, what they do is just copy and paste existing solutions and repeating the same mistakes. So, uh, you, you, you know, you, you, you basically duplicate the existing technical debt. 
but also uh, people often will not reuse solutions that exist that are good and instead introduce something new even though they should have used an, an, an existing piece of code. And a personal pet peeve of mine in the kernel is lack of a good deprecation mechanism. Um, so we, we don't use GCC or compiler attributes for uh, emitting warnings on, on when, whenever someone tries to compile a deprecated symbol. We have check patch, but it is... Uh, First, modifying anything in check patches is, is quite hard, and I, 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 I haven't seen uh, many people use uh, add symbols to check patch that should warn on, on using deprecated functions. Um, and documentation is mo for most part ignored. So I, I, I've ha in the subsystem I maintain, I've had uh, deprecation warnings for symbols for a long time, and people still uh, even every now and then try to use symbols that should not be used. I maintain the JPIO subsystem, and it's a very good example of how technical debt adds up over years, how it stacks, and uh, this is a system. This is a subsystem that has existed for two decades, and I don't think it's avoidable to introduce uh, issues with technical debt over over such a long period of time, and especially as I'm going to show the GPIO subsystem has everything going against it. So back in the day, way before device tree, way uh, before uh, even the driver model existed, we had uh, you know, board files uh, for, for, for various platforms. So back then, GPIO wasn't a subsystem. It was basically a way to toggle pins, and people introduced a certain semi-standardized uh, number of functions that would request a pin, uh, set its value, read its value. And then these would just be the function prototypes and you would, uh, like different architectures would implement those uh, symbols um, as, you know, C prototypes and then they would implement them in, in, in summer. So later the GPIO subsystem evolved into a provider consumer model, but based on a global number space, simply because those numbers were already used in these initial uh, semi-standardized symbols. And eventually, the subsystem evolved into a proper modern kernel provider consumer model with a framework with uh, opaque descriptors for GPIO lines. But it doesn't change the fact that the old code existed and the new came on top of it. So internally, we're still using the global number space. Internally, externally, the old interface is still there and it's still supported and uh, last time I saw some, something like 35% of all GPIO consumers still use the old interface because it's simply so hard to convert them all. Also, over the years, the GPIO subsystem had uh, periods, well, had many maintainers before and also had periods where there were no maintainers at all. And important decisions were made during the time where there were no maintainers, like for instance, merging the SysFS uh, interface was done when there, 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 was no, uh, there was no maintainer active for the GPIO subsystem. Finally, GPIOs are used everywhere. It's, uh, it's a thing that every driver uses, either, not every, but many drivers use either implicitly or explicitly. Implicitly request GPIOs or use resets or use uh, regulators where underneath we're going to use GPIOs. And also many devices next to their primary function, they also register GPIOs with the, with the GPIO lib and export them. So it's no wonder that over the years we have, uh, we have become this. And it's not to say that uh, it's someone's fault in particular. I'm not pointing fingers at anyone because over so many years, even if you just allowed a very simple uh, workaround here or a trick here, if everyone does it over the years, it simply adds up. GPIO subsystem has had uh, three main, uh, let's say, epochs in, in its history. So the prehistory is the time where we didn't have anything uh, unified. So every subsystem did something differently. Some symbols would be uh, standardized and, and used by multiple drivers, but many would add their own extensions or their own symbols. The drivers, because I'm, 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 I'm 
uh, using quotes because this was before the driver model even existed, lived in Arch in every particular platform. Like if you look at the ARM history where we would have Mac this, Mac this, Mac this, many different machines and all of them would implement something a bit differently. Uh, the fallout from it still exists because we still have some of those old platforms implement GPIO drivers in Arch and just it's, it's, it's basically stitched together with the GPIO subsystem so that it works in a standard way, but it's, not, uh, it's, it's, it's far from being correct. Then in 2008, uh, we gained the provider consumer model. It was based on the half hard-coded, half dynamic GPIO numbering scheme. This is the one that still exists under the hood in today's uh, GPIO subsystem. The, this is also the time where the where the, where the SysFS user space interface has been merged. And the user space uh, interface back then also was based on the, same, on the same number space. So now we literally cannot get rid of that anymore or it will take several more years because user space is used to it and uh, they, will, they will want it to keep on working, including keep the same numbering scheme. So we cannot even change that. Um, and yeah, so this work, like uh, consumers would get numbers, like consumer drivers would get numbers assigned uh, through platform code. They will request the, the number GPIOs, use them, free them. But the, th the, way, the, the, the way it was implemented, the, the, the fact that we were using numbers means that rogue drivers can simply request some GPIO defined in a header, like they can say, okay, the GPIO 201 is this, and I want to request it. And nobody would uh, enforce any, any consumer provider, uh, consumer provider resource assignment because, because the, what we're really re referring to is numbers. The answer to that is the opaque descriptor-based model, which is the, the current modern-day standard in the kernel. This means that uh, provider drivers would expose GPIO chips. We would, they would have a certain number of GPIOs, and then through device tree or platform files or ACPI, we would assign GPIOs to consumer drivers uh, or other consumer devices, and they would get opaque handles to, to structures they can't, can, can't, can't really access and using the provided program, programming interface, they would uh, manipulate them. There, what, what's happened though is that we have so many users of the all interface that we cannot possibly convert them all at once. So what we do is we support the old interface. The new interface uses the old internals of the, of the, of the, of the Uses the, the, old in, the new interface uses the old interface internally or in big part. And what we are doing is we are trying to first convert all the old users to using the new interface. And this has been going on for years. What we have to do is, you know, you have to, the, the new interface is completely different. So you need to convert your board files if they exist or convert your, you know, add properties to, to, to device tree. You need to convert the driver code. Um, then eventually you switch to the new, you, you, you complete your series of switching to, 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 to the new subsystem, you, to the new interface, you send those patches. You need to wait for the, for the people who have rele relevant hardware to test it. Then they will, they will send you uh, feedback and uh, give their tested by TAC, and this is where the work is done on that user, but you move to another one. And we cannot remove the old interface until we convert all the users. But uh, even then, once the work in the kernel is done, we st we're still left with SysFS in the exported user space. We cannot enforce the migration of user space users to the new descriptor-based kernel uh, API if they don't switch. Uh, so how do, we make it, uh, how do we make everyone switch to the new interface in user space? About that in a minute. Uh, so this is the first 
part of uh, dealing with technical debt in GPIO. We have spent so much effort on converting all the users to the new one, and uh, there is no end in sight because we have so many uh, people, so many, so many drivers still using the old interface. That I, I suppose that we're the kernel is going to remove support for 32-bit ARM before we actually finish that, and uh, this is going to be the this is going to be how we, how we solve it. So more technical debt. Initially, uh, you would ask yourself, how difficult can GPIO be? Like, uh, how can how can how difficult can toggling pins be? Well, the answer is just as difficult as you want it to be. Initially, when we started, uh, well, when 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 kernel gained the ability to toggle GPIOs, this was only for GPIOs exposed by SOCs, and they will usually be toggled, you know, in the startup, in the power-up sequence of the of the of the board. But eventually, we gained all kinds of use cases: uh, dynamic devices on GPIOs, like GPI, I'm sorry, GPIO expanders on, on USBs that you plug in, and then you want to access them from user space. All kinds of uh, situations where you would have expanders, uh, sensors that would, uh, you know, trigger at any point. You need to handle GP. Uh, you can, sorry, you need to handle interrupts. And this is where, uh, when you have multiple devices and multiple drivers and multiple users, you need to introduce some kind of serialization, some kind of locking. So look at that. What uh, we have here is uh, your typical system as it is today, where you have multiple GPIO drivers. Some of them are MIO drivers. They never sleep. Some of them go over some uh, bus where, where, the, where the transfer enforces sleeping. The users, on the other hand, uh, don't know w what kind of GPIOs they're accessing. And the users may want to toggle a GPIO from atomic context, or they may never sleep and, and toggle it from process context. So this all goes through the same code path through the, through the GPIO lib core. And it turned out that we cannot use spin locks because our, our drivers may sleep, but we also cannot use mutexes because we may be called from atomic context. This led to all kinds of things. And uh, until recently, you would find stuff like this in GPIO lib, where you would take a spin lock, do something you know, within that lock, then, oh no, I can now call a function that may sleep. So I need to unlock the spin lock. I need to do my sleeping stuff and I need to reacquire it. So I, I only release it for, for a little bit. It, it can't hurt, right? No state would be re-verified uh, in, 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 in this case. And uh, if that's not enough, because GPIOs are tightly coupled with pin control, and because GPIO controllers can also be interrupt controllers, we have glue layers to the interrupt subsystem. We have glue layer to pin control. Pin control uses mutexes everywhere because it was not meant to be used from atomic context. On the other hand, the interrupt subsystem will call our GPIO callbacks with a spin lock taken that the spin lock is actually exist in the, in, in the interrupt subsystem. So this was quite uh, quite quite an issue I uh, it's, it's taken me uh, some time to figure it out and it turns out that a good me mechanism for that existed this was SRCU which uh, which is RCU that allows you to call sleeping functions basically uh, RCU allows you to uh, take read logs from uh, SRCU allows you to take the read, it's, it's, you, you have to think about it. It's not really a, a read-write semaphore, but it, uh, it, it can be presented in a similar way. So you have read only critical sections, and then you have uh, a, a mechanism of synchronizing all those read critical sections uh, when you introduce some changes. So the lack of locking in GPIO started to become a problem. We, we would have some reports about, uh, about, about race conditions, but it was, for the reasons I mentioned, it was very hard to fix. So eventually, and this is uh, the positive uh, point in, in this presentation, the code has landed for 6.9 where SRC will be used for enforcing serialization in the GPIO. So this part of technical debt has finally been addressed, and uh, yeah, I'm very happy about it. There is still some issues uh, with the interrupt subsystem where uh, we, we still have some problems with, uh, with in, 
with the GPIO subsystem not being notified about their existing users that had requested interrupts pro provided by those GPIO chips, but this is something that, uh, that, that is left to fix. Anyway, the situation right now is much better than it used to be. Non-exclusive GPIO, so the <laughs> Christoph's favorite. At some point, we had a use case in, regula in the regulator subsystem where we needed to provide GPIOs that uh, could be used by multiple users. Because if you don't know, GPIOs can only be requested exclusively. There is no such thing as uh, non -ex like Unlike, for instance, the reset subsystem, a GPIO should only be requested by a single user, either in user space or in the kernel. Not really, because we, we did introduce uh, a workaround for fixed uh, regulators, and it was supposed to only be used by the regulator subsystem. The non-exclusive GPIOs, is, uh, it, it sounds nice, but it's nothing like what you imagine. What it really is, it simply allows two users to request the same GPIO and then fight over it. No synchronization, no nothing, no reference counting. They basically can say, okay, I'm turning it on. No, I'm turning it off. And uh, it's, it's bad. We didn't catch the fact that other people, even though the comments stated very clearly, this is a workaround for fixed regulators. People started using it and now you have them all over the kernel and uh, it's gonna be you know, another couple weeks or months of effort to first find a proper solution, maybe reference counted GPIOs, I, I don't know yet, find all the users, convert them, and then finally kill this interface. And it's not the only one because we have other things like, for instance, the MMC uh, slot uh, code, handling code, uh, re really required to, a way to toggle the active low setting um, because of reasons. It was provided for them, marked as, okay, this is a workaround only for the MMC slot uh, code. Bam, and everyone, not, not everyone, but there are several users now and uh, we need to get rid of them. There were functions, so initially we decided that only reading values, setting values, and changing the direction or reading the direction in GPI of GPIOs will be allowed to be called from atomic context. Turns out that people started just calling other functions from atomic context. We didn't annotate them with might sleep. Maybe might sleep didn't even exist back then. I'm not sure. We now have functions that are used wrong, even though the documentation states otherwise. And the worst, again, the worst kind of in technical debt is uh, when you accrue technical debt in your programming interfaces, but uh, the, the, the really worst kind in the kernel is the one that you expose to user space, which one that you cannot just, in the kernel, as long as you have something in the kernel, you can go and, and fix the instances where it's used and then kill the interface. In user space, it doesn't work like this. This kind of technical debt cannot be improved if paid back, if you will, if the user space doesn't comply. So we have this old SysFS interface for GPIOs. It uses the number space, uh, the, the, the old GPIO numbering. We have provided a character device for GPIOs that map the two level hierarchy that we have, so the chip and the lines underneath. But the users complain about, uh, about an issue. The issue is that in SysFS, you would have persistence of state. And it's not to say that you don't have that with the character device, because the SysFS is simply a user of GPIOs. It requests GPIOs on behalf of the user space. So you can imagine the SysFS is the program, is the server to which you go and tell, okay, export this one, this GPIO, use it, toggle it, uh, wait for interrupts. But users don't care about the, the philosophy behind it, they, they want a persistent state, they want to toggle a GPIO and, and they want it to keep the state. So we need to uh, find a good solution and you know, the character device has been, for eight year, has been around for eight years now and everyone really complains about the same thing. So I finally decided to manage this, this uh, technical loan by providing an interface. So uh, I just posted a set of patches that implement a Dbus API for GPIO. So you have a daemon that works on behalf of all the users. It provides a well-known protocol and a set of functions. And uh, I should have posted the link here. I, I think when I, at the time when I was writing it, the, the, the patches were not out. Were not out. Um, but the daemon is now 
being reviewed. It's, it's still going to take probably some, some, some time, at least uh, a couple months. But this is something that I really hope will address the issue and finally will allow people to start switching to the new interface. The Raspberry Pi community actually expressed a uh, rather positive feedback on, on the DBus API, so hopefully this will allow us to improve the situation on that front. Yeah, so even if we think that from the kernel perspective we have a good solution, uh, our goal is to make the user space happy because the kernel serves the user space after all. One of the ideas that, uh, this was not mine, this was Linus Valesh who did that, but uh, we had lots of quirks in the GPIO subsystem in different drivers. What Linus did was he went through all of them and basically gathered them in a single file that we have. So, for instance, all the open firmware quirks, various, you know, strange ways of, of handling properties, of handling uh, some, some, some weird nodes in, in device tree, were put into single place. There was actually quite, quite, quite well refactored. And now all the quirks live in a single uh, place. This allows the rest of the code to look much better. And then we have this dark place where, you know, you don't venture if you don't have to, where all the, all, all the weird stuff lives. So, summary. It's impossible to keep technical debt out of a large code base. And let me go back to how the question, how difficult can GPIOs been, be? Well, they can be 10,000 10, lines of code difficult. Uh, this, is the, this is the level. So toggling pin and you need uh, 10,000 lines of code to handle that. You will, you will accrue technical debt. And it's hard to catch every user using your interfaces incorrectly. And what you should do is just uh, really filter the code that you're accepting into your subsystem. So it's fine to be grumpy. Don't be bullied into accepting subpar code. I think that the kernel should really, could really use some kind of a good deprecation mechanism for old symbols or symbols that should not be used or symbols that are being used incorrectly. I don't have the answer. If that was my choice, I would probably allow using the GCC's uh, deprecated attribute for functions, but we don't want warnings if our, in our kernel built and that would result in thousands of warnings. And uh, that's it. So yeah, uh, a few years that I've been doing this, and it's been it's been uh, it's been challenging, but also kind of fun. So you can reach us at linaro.org, or you can write me directly with any questions. Send me patches, send me ideas, and time for questions. So specifically to the CFS uh, interface, which we all love, of course. Um, of course, I understand we cannot remove it from one day to another for ABI compatibility, but do you think it would be possible that newly added uh, GPIO uh, providers, uh, drivers, uh, do not expose uh, their GPIOs in CFS? So at some point, users of new devices will be forced to, to adapt. Uh, it doesn't look like a breakage to me, but. You're not wrong, I guess. It's, uh, yeah. Thanks for giving me an idea. I will, I will consider it. I have never thought about it because this is an abstraction level. So I never, uh, I, I, would, I would think that all the citizens of the GPIO driver uh, space should be equal. But who says that, right? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's, it's a good idea. Yeah, we can. Can definitely consider that. Thank you. Um, well, just the other day, I tried to switch from SysFS to GPIO lib, and I came across exactly this problem that uh, all my user space code needs this persistence. And actually, I needed to stop. It was just not possible because I, I would have 
had to rewrite everything or introduce a demon and um, yeah, with the debuffs, um, communicate with it. So I really feel that that's a good thing. And I think at that point when this is there, I could then switch. So I think that's that's a good way. So please go to Linux GPIO, the Linux GPIO mailing list and uh, just test the patches because that, that's what I need right now. So uh, the daemon is there. There is a command line client that you can use uh, in your script if, you, if you're doing scripts. Or you can use whatever you know, dbus uh, standardized command line client that you want to use. GDbus is fine. Like, this, this will work because, uh, because of the standards that, uh, that dbus provides. And yeah, if you could test it and, and send feedback and review, that would be awesome. Thank you. OK, are there any questions? If not, then going once, going twice. Let's go to the closing game. 